This is a mystical story about a magical circus. Not the kind of magic that involves pulling rabbits out of hats, but the kind where individuals' inner talents manifest into genuine magical abilities, known as sparks. These performers, these sparks, choose to use their gifts not for conquest, but to inspire and bring joy to those who need it. But it's not all whimsy and light. This historical fantasy takes place in the hopeful but ominous years between World War I and World War II. We're talking about the audiobook for The First Bright Thing with narrator Patria Burchard and author J.R. Dawson on this Desideratum. A desideratum is an essential thing. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, and I found so many essential things in this conversation. You're about to hear author J.R. Dawson open up about her personal experiences with theater, which has served as an outlet for her creativity and weirdness. She speaks passionately about how theater education validates and gives voice. It's a big part of her characters and setting in the first bright thing. Before we begin, I want to sincerely thank this episode's sponsor, Positron. Positron provides fantastic services for audio artists and producers like me. I use Positron for prepping and proofing the audiobooks I narrate. I use what I need each month through their subscription service. You can sign up for a free demo of all that they offer at Positron.com. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, good. That's narrator Patria Burchard checking her audio. She joins us from her padded, cozy home studio with a shock of silver hair and a short pixie cut. I enjoyed this so much, but I've been struggling with explaining it to people. Yeah, it doesn't really fit any one category. It's so different. Yeah. So I guess maybe that's a good place to start with Jen sort of explaining, how do you describe this story to people? Yeah, so I usually start with the circus. This is author J.R. Dawson. You'll hear us use her first name, Jen. Her Zoom screen shows us she's on a deep, cushioned couch that makes her look small, and she's tied her thick brown hair back to fit under her headset. The first bright thing is her debut novel. Yeah, so I usually start with the circus and people's like inner talents have manifested into uh, an individual like magical ability that they can do and they're called the sparks. Everybody in the in the circus has decided that instead of like going out and conquering the world or whatever, they're going to put on a good show <laughs> and um, bring this uh, piece of inspiration to people who need to see it on a night that they need to see it. Yes. They provide something that someone needs to see. So they are in service through performance, through their special abilities. And sometimes like it's it's one person, right? So they're making a difference in this one person's life. That was a really big theme to me of what set, what set them apart. This idea that just making, just being a light in one for one person. Yes. And that's what matters. I I also thought that um these sparks, these people in the circus. That's narrator Patria chiming in. These people in the circus. Their sparks sort of correspond to what we might think of today as differences. You know, your quirk, your weirdness, whatever that might be. In your story, these things are assets and they are beautifully combined. So each person has something different that sets them off and maybe even makes them weird in general society. But when they come together in this circus, they have these beautiful, magical talents that they combine to create something you can't find anywhere else. And between them all together, it's they have a lot of power. Yeah. 
It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. One of the things that I love that you capture actually is like not just the voice of these unique individuals because they are, you just said they're, they're a little weird. They're a little quirky, right? You brought a lot of that kind of energy into your performance. Oh, well, that's great. I really wanted to. And you know, honestly, it's hard not to when the material is that much fun and you can really, the characters are that clear and they are that interesting. You just, it's like you made my job easier, Jen. I'm not just sitting here to praise you either. It's, it's really, it really is easier for me anyway to dig into a book where where the author really creates real humans, you know? When I usually, like, think about it, like, just, like, in the abstract, I'm like, okay, uh, Tim played Ed and Patria played Red. And then you really look at it and it's like, no, <laughs> Patria played everybody. <laughs> like, because like, my background is in playwriting. And so, like, it was like a one-woman show. Well, except I have to say, can you get enough of Tim's voice? Oh, my gosh. He has the most gorgeous voice. He did it so beautifully. He does gorgeous and dark, though. Gorgeous and dark. Yeah. He stood in a deep, deep trench, not yet dead, but cut off from any life he recognized. The fields were silent until they weren't. Somewhere beyond sight, but creeping closer, he heard the whistling thunderstorm of mortars and machine guns. He couldn't breathe. He could barely swallow back vomit from the musty smell in the muddy air, a smell of men's blood and sweat, of earth opened and bombed, and of dead rats' flesh melting onto their bones. Gunpowder, tobacco and piss, planes above, shite below. And that's Tim Campbell. He has narrated over 800 titles, He has won or been nominated for almost every major award in the audiobook industry, including a 2018 Audi. He has lived and trained in the UK and Germany, and he narrates as both an American and, as you just heard, as a Brit. In this audiobook, he plays the Circus King, a complicated and dark figure. But Jen has written all her characters with darkness and light. Like, even if we just take Rin, who Jen was saying, like, she's kind of your main character. She suffers and struggles and has a dark past that we sort of slowly learn about as we're listening longer and longer. And I don't know, even like her physical being, right? Uh, Jen lets her age very creaky and... Yeah, yeah. I don't know, there were, there were a lot of physical cues for you to work from, I guess. Well, yeah, and you're an actor too. And, any, and a different actor might have read it in a different way. We all have our ways of interpreting those things. It's not, not like Jen just handed me every detail and all I had to do was follow it. But it's very inspiring material. And you're a playwright, Jen, so you know that at some point, I think the, the writer, at least when you're going to have somebody else perform the work... You kind of hand it over to them. Yep. And you have to hope that they have some idea of what to do. <laughs> but um, that's where it kind of becomes greater than the sum of its parts. Yes. You know, it becomes a collaboration. Well, and not much like the circus itself becomes this collaboration, right? It's greater than the individual pieces. And there's so much of that living in this story. Yeah. That's a great analogy, Patria. That's beautifully said. Um, One of the themes that I wanted to talk about, there's references to theater and entertainment and the power of performance really woven through this story. You know, it's part of how we connect. It's part of how we, I don't know, it's just, it's more than a show. And so I wondered where that came from for you, Jen, why that was important for these characters and for this overarching storyline. Yeah, so I think that growing up, in a conservative area of the United States. I mean, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. My uh, outlet for weirdness was theater, was community theater and um, doing a bunch of stuff at the Rose, which is one of the 
country's biggest children's theaters. Um, and they have a lot of really great programming for kids and teenagers. And it was in those spaces that I met weirdos like me. And we had some sort of worth. Like I would go to my school and really didn't have a lot of friends growing up and like was considered just kind of an oddball and nobody really understood. I'd go home. Not really a lot of people understood me there either. And then I'd go into this space where there was a stage and I had worth and um, I had validity and my my voice mattered. And so um, when I got older and I started looking into what I was going to do for a career, I started teaching um, and got into theater education. And so for a long time, my my main job was to go into outreach programs, go into public schools or libraries, et cetera, like summer programs, um, and do uh, workshops with kids who had never done theater ever or had done minimal theater. I was always blown away as to how much it mattered to me and to the kids and to the parents and to the audience. And I think that that's really where theater's power is, is in that educational aspect. Um, and teaching kids uh, and people who feel like maybe they're a weirdo how to make their voice, not how to make their voice matter, but that their voice does matter. Yes, isn't that such a funny byproduct, right? Of getting up and pretending to be someone else somehow helps you tap in to who you really are. Yes. Oh, for sure. Well. I want to mention from the storyline that we're sort of bookended by World War One and World War Two looming. And the scenes that you give us from World War One in in the trenches, I I don't know how you worked your way through those, Patria. Like, like how did you prepare for those days where you knew you had to live those things in your booth? You know, um I didn't. I didn't prepare any differently for those things than for any other things. Um, mm. It's it's not. <laughs> this is going to sound a little weird, but you know we're talking about being weird, so okay. Here, here's my weirdness. Um, these things affect me, and I want to be affected. So, in a way, it's it's good. It's joyous for me to feel these things. Frankly, reading the news today is not joyous, but a fictionalized account of something that happened long ago feels a little further away. And so maybe experiencing that is easier than experiencing something that's actually happening right now. I don't know. Maybe that's a weird way to describe it. But I want to feel those things. I want to... I want to feel an affinity for the people in the story. To me, that's a that's a good thing. It feels good to do that. Yeah, I actually think that's a great way of explaining it. That's sort of a time traveler's way of explaining it, Patria. Well, so why, Jen, did you choose this this section of time to work your story into? Yeah, so I uh, went to go see Peter Jackson's "They Shall Not Grow Old," which is this documentary where he takes old footage of World War I, specifically um, in, around the Battle of the Somme and in the, in the trenches. And he slows down the pace of the film and he colorizes it and he puts sound to it. So it looks like it could have been shot on a camera yesterday. Mm. And it was, it was heart-wrenching. And the idea that these kids that went into the trench, like a lot of them did not come out and the ones who did it was devastating. Um, and one of my, you know, one of my hats as an educator is a Holocaust educator. So I already knew what was coming after all that. Like they keep saying the war to end all wars. And then, you know, the, the atrocities that happened in the 40s. And I was like, God, that, that little pocket where in the 20s where at least the United States really thought that things were going to be okay. Yeah. Like, what if you knew that they weren't? Um, and I really related to that. I was, you know, it was 2018. So we were in a particular presidential era and I'm queer, non-binary and Jewish in Omaha and things were not getting better. And I mean, they ended up not getting. And 
so it, it, it was just like, wow, how, how do you keep getting up in the morning when you know that a lot of bad stuff is happening and is going to happen? And I thought that that was an important conversation because we do really need hope in this time. We also need to understand that hope isn't something that's weak or innocence or ignorance. Hope is something that you go into and you still have and it's strong, even though you know how terrible the world can be. And so for me, it was really important to show those bookends Because I don't think a lot of people in the United States know how bad Hiroshima was. And I know that I particularly didn't know how bad the trenches were before I saw the documentary. I think that a lot of the time we kind of like to look away and being able to look at something that happened 100 years ago and really see it for what it is, maybe today when something terrible happens, we can say no. And that never again actually means something. But we go into it with hope uh, and with a belief that we're going to get through it. Yeah. I can hear so many of your characters in your voice just then. It's just funny hearing you just speak off the cuff about it. And and there were many times where there was sort of like a, a sense of helplessness about the bad. Oh, yeah. And I I appreciated actually the way that you wove tradition, Jewish tradition specifically, into these ideas of hope and where to find hope and how to hang on to hope. Do you want to talk about how you did that? I'm thinking of a mitzvah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sparks are actually a thing from Jewish tradition where it's the idea that each one of us has a spark of the good or the light or the divine inside of us. And our job is to bring that spark out in each other and make the world literally a brighter place. So when I constructed the world, I made it like, I thought about it as every single one of these characters do have a spark. Not all of them have manifested physically. So uh, I think that the really beautiful part of Judaism is believing, yeah, the world sucks. Now what are we going to do about it? And that idea of like, yeah, the world is unjust. Now what? Now what? Like, yeah, we, we feel awful about this and we acknowledge this. And now what are we going to do? And so that that's that's a lot of strength. And it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily like, you know, step one, step two, step three. Yeah, it's not a direct answer to a hard question. It's more an overall belief system that is, that doesn't say, oh, nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. Can't say that, but there will be light. And that we are responsible for making sure that that's true. Yes. That it's it's our actions that need to, even when it's hard to stand up for, you know, what's right and make sure that everybody is safe and the world's a light place. <laughs> yes. I also, I like the way um, that the, the people that you've given these sparks to that are the really the strongest magical abilities, all sort of grapple with their yin and yang, uh, their light and dark, uh, and how even with magical powers, we can feel insecure, unloved. I thought the way that you juxtaposed not just a bad guy being bad and someone good being good, but all of our good guys and bad guys having these moments, we brought us into their heads for just a more in-depth look at what it means to be light or dark. Yeah, no, I think that I grew up with the, you know, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man of with great power comes great responsibility. Like if you have some sort of power, be it like, uh, you know, you're super convincing when you speak to people, let's say, or <laughs> you are really good at painting the world how you see it. Um, or you're great at leading people and people look up to you, like with that power, you know, are you going to influence and treat people kindly or are you going to be selfish about it? Or, you know, I think that each one of us has the ability to be a real snot or to be, you know, a shining light. (laughs) And that's why it's so, that's why it's so amazing and wonderful when somebody does something 
good because they didn't necessarily have to do it. Yes, each time it was a choice. Well, okay. The other word that comes up multiple times is shuva. Shuva, I, I really love because it means that you were always good enough. It's a return to who you who you have always been. Um, and I think that working with young folks, it's and working with with people who are artists, I feel like a lot of us are like, well, if I, you know, wasn't neurodivergent or I wasn't disabled or I, you know, wasn't queer or I wasn't this or I wasn't that, then I'd be enough. Then people would like me. Then, you know, there's this perfect, like, shadow of who I'm supposed to be somewhere. Um, and and it's like, no, no, you're you're good just the way you are. But like, Mr. Rogers said it, like, like you just the way you are and that's enough. So Shiva isn't necessarily a forgiveness of oneself, but it's a return to one's inner core and, and, and who you were. Yeah, I loved it. Okay, let's see. Read through my notes real quick. Okay. Can I say something about, about Patria's pronunciations though? Like one thing that I was really excited about is that Patria knew how to pronounce all of these small towns. I think I got to hear like the audition tape and she said, Carney. I was like, well. <laughs> My uncle lived in Carney. The book takes place a lot in the Midwest. Not all of it, but most of it, the largest proportion of it. And um, Jen is from Omaha and I'm from DeKalb, Illinois, and I know that train route. I know that route. My uncle lived in Kearney. Uh, my cousins were in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. And part of the circus takes place in Lawrence, Kansas, where I was born. Wow. So I just felt like, oh my God, I have to have this book. Please give me this book. When I read those things, I was like, oh my God, I just fell in love with it. It was so home for me. It felt like home for me. Yeah, it is important. I think we, whether we realize it or not, we very much see ourselves as a, as connected to places. And they hold, even if you haven't lived there in a really long time, they hold this sort of deep core memory kind of feeling. Yeah, it's, and that's one of the, actually one of the notes I do have is about Colorado. So I've spent the last 25 years in Colorado and oh, you make Colorado just a magic place. It is magic to me. Yeah, it was funny because one of the first like author events I did was in Denver in front of um, a bunch of really wonderful like independent booksellers. Um, and I was so excited because I like our magical place in growing up was Estes Park, Colorado. Um, and we would do this like road trip where we started in Fort Collins and worked our way down through the mountains to Colorado Springs. And like we stopped in Denver and all this. And like, so every summer it was this like, wow, mountains exist thing. There is a majesty to them. And I think you really captured that the way that they ground us, maybe like in feeling small in who we are, but knowing that we're part of something bigger and yeah, I guess the one thing I wanted to come back to Patria about is we've we've talked a little bit about how, you know, being different is kind of the essence of a spark. But there are things in this time frame, in the circus, in the Midwest or in Lawrence, Kansas, that they do hide from their audience. I'm I'm thinking specifically about this love. And for some some ways to me, this is really a love story. And I just wonder, Patria, how you felt about Rin and Odette that part of the love story. Rin held Odette's firm hips, her fingers feeling the rough sequin hems. Odette smiled, sweat beating down her rosy cheeks, and gave a breathy laugh as the audience swelled in cheers. Rin had nearly forgotten there was anyone else in this tent. Amazing job, Rin whispered. Love you, Odette said, squeezing her hand before bouncing away and waving emphatically at the audience. She bowed, and Rin felt a hook cut into her gut. If Rin had been a boy, or if Odette had been a boy, they could have kissed in front of these people. In fact, the crowd would have positively swooned for the two of them, roaring into whistles and croons as they'd have held each other closer. But even with all the love threaded between them, Rin reminded herself that she couldn't hold Odette for too long in the spotlight. The audience was enchanted by them, their magic, 
their differentness. But a kiss would break the spell, and the audience would realize the magic was no show. This was real, and it was all right to be different, until it wasn't. Uh, the, the line that I underlined like five times after I copied was, it was all right to be different until it wasn't. That's a timeless thing right there. Yeah, especially working like in children's theater. This is Jen chiming in. Like in children's theater, there were a lot of times where Omahans would come see the show with their kids and oh my gosh, is it, you know, Shrek awesome and all this. But then like, if they saw us, you know, leaving, in our street clothes or whatever, then we would, you know, we were like weirdo queeros or whatever, you know, like it, it, there's always been this weird dichotomy between actors and audience where we're in it together when it's a play. And then when that fourth wall breaks or when that, that spell wears off all of a sudden, like we are shenanigan freelancers, we're weirdos and they are the patrons. As a performer, uh, it, it is it is a little uncomfortable sometimes. And the other thing is that I wanted to say about their their marriage is that um, when I started writing it, I was like, yeah, well, I'm going to make them married because I'm going to make them married. Like, okay, it, you know, sparks exist. But the more the, of the research that I did, the angrier I got because the 20s were actually in some ways... Um, the 20s were before the Lavender Scare, and there are silent movies with sapphic kisses in them. Like, there were people who were out and queer in the United States. Um, and we see it again, like, you know, in the 60s and 70s, like, like there's this, this massive, like, roller coaster that happens of there is a queer culture. There was um, this massive queer culture in New York, um, especially... Uh, and then all of a sudden it gets shut down. And so around World War II in the 30s, et cetera, you know, there's the lavender scare, there's the the code, the code that comes out for for storytelling. And then we have, you know, in the 80s, we have an entire generation that's just lost. Um, so, you know, when I'm growing up in the early 2000s, I didn't have, I had maybe one queer elder who couldn't tell us that he was queer. Like we just kind of figured it out. But like, it, it was just like, well, there are no, there are no queer adults. And so that's why it's, it's so important now, like that as a queer elder, I guess I'm a queer elder now at, at age 36. Um, <laughs> but, but it's important that the kids, that, that kids who are coming up see that queer folks can have happy adulthoods and safe adulthoods and, and kind um, relationships. Something else I noticed also when I was reading your book first before I started narrating it I I uh I think I had already seen your picture on social media or something and I knew that you were not 60 or 80 you were not an elder looking back you were a young person and I'm 30 years older than you and I have seen these arcs these push and pull from left and right and they you are absolutely right it seems like we get it and then we we lose it and then we get it again and then we lose it and these cycles have always gone on and they always will and i think in the long term there is progress but i have 68 years to look back on where i can see that progress and you don't but you see it anyway. That's the amazing thing. You have this mature outlook that is so wise. Um, that arc between World War I and World War II, the way you saw it, the way you depict it in the book, is just outstanding. It's just so insightful and beautiful. Um, really terrific. That means a lot. That was one of the first things that I wanted to do, though, with the book is have a protagonist, have somebody who was super strong and a woman and not 25. <laughs> I thought that as some like I was I was hitting 30 around the time that I started conceiving this, which is a drop in the bucket when it comes to your entire life. But it, it was this weird like transition of, oh, I'm not a kid anymore. 
and especially with with my crotchy crotchy old body, I I have certain disabilities, and so I was like, oh, this is going to get worse. Great. So I. Uh, the idea of of like, okay, I can't look at Disney princesses anymore. I can't look at, you know, Meg from Wrinkle in Time anymore. And so I started like thinking about the characters that we have who are older than 30 and women. Um, and and they are out there, but they are not as, you know, prevalent or as in number as like Gandalf. It's one thing that I really wanted to do is is do right by Rin and uh have somebody to look up to and be excited to to grow into. Yeah, she's a great heroine. I think so too. And I think you really did understand, you really do understand some of the fears and thoughts that come with aging. They exist. They are there. And you treated them so gently and so fairly and so honestly. That's terrific, yeah. Okay, so the last question I like to ask has to do with the name of the podcast. I named it Desert Eratum, which means an essential thing. And there was a poem called Desert Arata that hung on the wall when I was growing up, and it's full of essential things. So for you as a storyteller, and we've done this a lot, we've touched around and dug around a lot this hour. But if someone were to say to you, Jen, what's really essential? How do you answer? Um, I would say... Um... So my book launch, my my good friend who was the MC for the night asked me like, you know, what is the call to action at the end of this book? What do you want people to take away from the book? Like, do you want them to go plant a tree or like punch a Nazi or like, what do you want? And I was like, I, you know, that's all good. But also before that, <laughs> what's essential is that you understand that you're enough. And I don't think that we hear that a lot. Um and I think it's, there's always, well, you could be better. Well, why did you do that? You know, or there's always some sort of criticism. And so I think that to just take a breath and be like, you're good. <laughs> like you, how you are is great. And that, you know, that's a very powerful message for the queer community. And also as a millennial, it's a powerful message for me <laughs> um, to give to myself, like, you know, that you are seen and that, however you come to the table is is great a big thank you to jen also known as jr dawson and thanks to narrator patria burchard narrator tim campbell and all the fine folks at tour publishing group including producer steve wagner for sharing the spellbinding clips you heard and for bringing the first bright thing audiobook to life I hope you'll want to listen to the rest of the story wherever you get your audiobooks. I'll put a link to Libro.fm in the show notes. When you buy your audiobook from Libro.fm, you can choose a local-to-you bookstore to support. And when you follow the affiliate link in the show notes or on the Desert Autumn website, you also support this pod. Another big thank you to Positron for helping to make this episode possible by sponsoring Desert Autumn Podcast Productions. It's 2024, and this is Desert Aratum's fourth season. There are some exciting episodes on the way. I've partnered with Denver Community Media to produce a series with author Sylvia Petum about her book, In Search of the Blonde Tigress, the untold story of Eleanor Jarman. It's a story about a woman who got caught up in a Chicago crime spree. She went to prison, convicted as an accomplice to murder, only to escape and live out her life as America's longest-running female fugitive. Her compelling story is coming soon on Desideratum. Thanks for listening. <laughs>